Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules to be here. Um, this is a long-awaited program. Um, we started planning this um, pre-COVID. Um, and so I'm personally excited uh, to be able to, to have this program today and to see so many of my colleagues here. Um, retention has always been a big word. Um, from the time I've been in student, student affairs, it encompasses so many things, the services, the resources, uh, academic, social uh, engagement that we have on our campus. Um, and we take all the, that information and put it into one little number at the end of the year um, that describes what our retention rate is. And so I'm hoping today that we'll be able to look beyond that um, and look at the services we provide, the resources we provide, and how faculty, staff, and students are part of that process, are part of making sure that our campus is the best campus for students to be at. Um, it is not the responsibility of one particular office. It really is the responsibility for all of us. So as I mentioned, this is a collaborative event, so I hope you can um, build relationships at your tables, share information from your offices, um, and hopefully at the end of the day, we'll have um, some really good ideas that we might be able to move forward. Um, there's a little card on your tables that if you are interested in continuing the conversation, just fill that out. Um, again, we're not gonna say, hey, you know, we need three hours a week or something like that, um, but we wanna keep the conversation going um, with the ideas that happened today. Um, so we're excited to have Dr. Glenn Davis um, um, talking about sense of belonging, which is a primary issue on our campus. And um, we'll, we'll start with Dr. Edward Bolden coming up and talking about um, our retention initiatives up to now. Thank you very much. Uh, I get to present now the one number that we boil all of the retention efforts down to. And that is our first to second year retention rate. Uh, I went back to 2004 because that was uh, a pretty good year in terms of, uh, that was the year I graduated from high school. Um, I didn't go here, so this is not me, this is not representative of me, but this is also a pretty good indicator of what retention has looked like over the past 16, 17 years. And what you're gonna see is very little change, right? If we were to look at trend and analyze the trend of our retention rate, it is ticking upward very, very slightly. So maybe by 2075, we'll be at 97%. Um, but you know, let, let's hope we continue on that right trend. But what we really take out of these numbers are, are the numbers are that of the students that are not here. Right, this boils down to between 85 and 100 students that are not coming back their second fall. And we can look even further to our first to third year retention rate. We're losing another 70, 75 students per cohort by the time they should be third years and are returning for fall semester. Again, overall movement in the upwards direction, which is good, suggesting that we're doing a better job at keeping our students here. Another thing that we like to look at is our graduation rate. A lot of people ask why we're looking at graduation rate in, in, in six years instead of in four years. Six years is the national standard of looking at graduation rates because some programs just naturally take longer than the expected four years. So our graduation rate over six years, again, a steady, small incline. All things pointing in the right direction. But after you look at these numbers, you know, what, what is there to do? What does this actually mean? Well, if this is what our number is, how come it's 85.5% and not 90%? Well, it must be a specific group. So we take these numbers and, and we splice these. Well, what's the difference between men and women? A national trend is that men retain worse than women. Women graduate at a higher rate than men do. But looking at our first to second year retention, yeah, there are some years where we do see a pretty large divide between men and women. And of course, large is here relative uh, because the difference is not really all that great. Uh, especially in the past couple of years, we've seen men and women retaining at about the same rate. The six year graduation rate looks quite a bit different. Again, sticking with national trends, overall we are moving in the right direction. Uh, but, but looking at these groups does not really help explain what is happening and why students may be leaving. We also try to look by race, ethnicity, or Pell status. And looking at these, even going back to 2013, 
isn't all that helpful because there's nothing that jumps out at us as saying, this is our issue, this is our concern, this is the group that we feel as though really need our services. So there's gotta be something more to it than what we consider our student demographic information. And we do the same thing with Pell status. We try to do the same thing with first generation status when we know about some of that stuff. We throw a lot of things that we can into this retention equation, hoping to find out what that silver bullet is and where we can intervene. But really there's way more to it than that. What is a good retention rate? Well, we look at the national average of first to second year, somewhere between 70 and 75%. Uh, those dark lines are who we consider uh, our peers or our peer aspirants. These are the best of the best, and we are that orange line, they're in the mix with the rest of them. You know, retaining students at 97, 98% could be a, a lofty goal for us, especially given where we've made progress very slowly over the past couple of years. Looking at six-year graduation rate is very much the same thing. Private university six-year graduation rate is about 68%. Uh, we are above 80%, which overall we are doing pretty good, but considering who we would like to think that our peers are, there is room for improvement. There's gotta be more to it, right? So behind the numbers, can we tell beforehand if students are gonna be retained and therefore graduate? We try to look at some of the pre-college characteristics. We look at their academic performance through high school, their GPA, some of their test scores when we get them. The high school academic program, is it a challenging high school or is it along the easier end of things? We also look at their college performance through their first semester or their first year. How many credits did they attempt and did they earn? Did they receive a grade of a D, F, or a W? And their GPA, a lot of times these are very predictive of whether or not they return for their second year. But greater than that, there are institutional characteristics. And distance to hometown is a big one. As we are pushing to become a national leading university, we are marketing to students more than ever in Texas, in California, and across the nation and across the world, where distance to hometown is not something that we can change, but instead maybe impact at least in another way. The institutional size, not much that we can change other than continue to bring in more students each year. The student to faculty ratio and selectivity, these are all very carefully thought out institutional characteristics. But way more than that are all of the student characteristics. We can look at student ability, you know, some of that indicative uh, of the test scores that they received while they were in high school. Demographics, like we've already talked about a little bit, including parental educational attainment, temperament, motivation. There are journals that, that only publish research on college student retention, and there's a lot of statistical modeling that goes into trying to identify who we think is going to be retained. And you'll see these variables across many, many research studies that feel as though if we can intervene on one of these or if we can impact one of these, that will help us when it comes time to retain our students. One of the bigger ones is the social connections made during the first six weeks. That is a very strong predictor of whether or not students feel as though they belong and whether or not students retain. There are also many other psychological factors like self-belief, self-efficacy, locus of control, and goal setting. What kind of goals have they set for themselves? So what we're really looking at here is the intersection between the institutional characteristics and the student characteristics. More to it than the one number that we try to represent retention as, we're looking at what we do as an institution and what the students bring to Case Western Reserve University. What data do we collect? Well, we collect a lot of satisfaction data. And just like our retention, we go way back with satisfaction data. Uh, much like our retention data, very little change in terms of satisfaction over the past 15, 16 years. Uh, you know, more than 80% of our students are satisfied. You do see dips in this graph, and that is really a function of the measurement. In the years where it's higher, we only offer a four-point scale, so students have to either say, yes, they are satisfied, or no, they are not. Where we see the dips, like in 2014 and 2016 and 2021, there's a neutral option, so students don't have to pick. Either they're satisfied or they're not. They can pick a middle-of-the-road type of a response. And that does eat away at the students who would say that they are satisfied otherwise. Uh, but overall, an 80% rate of student satisfaction is quite good when we think about it in the grand scheme of things. What else can we look at? Well, if you could start over, would you choose to attend Case Western Reserve University again? Again, given the same measurement techniques, we do see dips in some of those years. Uh, but again, pretty consistently around 80% of students would choose to attend CWRU again. 
I would love to see all of these numbers be 100%. Everybody should be satisfied. Everybody should want to choose CWRU all over again and recommend Case to a high school senior who resembles them. Uh, but in reality, we know that this can't be everything to every student. So more to it, what about feeling comfortable here? And this is something that we've just started to measure a little bit over the past couple of years, so there's big holes in this graph. But the rate at which students feel as though they're comfortable at CWRU, comfortable being themselves, because that's a big part of belonging, right? Do I have to feel, uh, do I feel like I'm comfortable being myself and being in my own shoes? The percentage of students who strongly agree or agree with this statement ranges very wildly. Of course, hovering around 80% is where we expect this number to be. And, and given the past year, uh, 2021, numbers are going to be lower. Uh, that's when most students were not even on campus. They took the survey in spring of 21. So just about out of the woods, or so they thought, of the, uh, the COVID virus. Um, you know, that had an impact on what we see in student, success, in student satisfaction and sense of belonging and a lot of other things that we hope to enhance by bringing students together on campus. More to it than whether or not students feel comfortable being themselves. What about fit? We saw this in a lot of open-ended responses. Students just don't feel as though they fit. And some of the students have provided information to us upon leaving. I never felt like I belonged. I really didn't sense that fit uh, between myself and the university. Again, this interaction between the student characteristics and the institutional characteristics. And here we're talking about sense of community or belonging. And this is something that this past year in, in spring 2021 was the first time we started asking questions specifically about this. So I worked with quite a few colleagues on how do we write the right questions to ask. And, and nobody really could define what fit is and how students feel the sense of belonging. So when we look at fit, really we're considering the student's capacity to develop the sense of belonging. They have to be ready. And on the institutional side, we're talking about creating a welcoming, caring, and supportive environment. Do we feel as though we do that? I think across student affairs, I think the answer is yes. And what, oh, oh geez, what this actually is gonna look like in terms of our students, and, and the research really suggests there's positive student-faculty relationships, the presence of adequate health and wellness resources, and encouragement of diversity and difference. That's what we're looking for at defining when it comes to fit in terms of modeling and predicting student retention, thanks to the existing research that's out there already. So this is the first year that we have asked questions about sense of belonging. And where we really started, instead of asking them, do you feel like you belong, it's where do you feel like you belong? Do you feel like you belong to CWRU as a whole? or some subset of that? Is it, to your first, is it to your first year, your class year? Do you belong with other seniors if you're a senior student? Is it at the level of your major or your college, your residence hall, the CWRU community of students? Is the, all of the students in there together? Student organizations and social groups, athletics, Greek life, those in your lab and those at your internship or co-op site, where do you feel the most affiliation to others at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, and, and the resounding results suggest that students very strongly affiliate with their major, their major areas. And just under that is student organizations and, and social groups. So providing those opportunities for students, not just by having student organizations for them to participate in, but other affiliations that are, could align with student major or areas of interest could be very powerful for us to look at moving forward. Uh, the something else numbers are very high, but there were very few students who responded to that. And most of the students that wrote in their own responses wrote something like my major and my school. So things that were already uh, uh, included in the above response options. So while it looks like that's really high, that really only represents a handful of students. So now that we know how students feel a sense of community or where they mostly affiliate, then we ask, how have each of the following contributed to your sense of community on campus? And now we're looking at groups on campus that include administrators, faculty, navigators, other staff, and peers. And what we're seeing here is that they you know, mostly are contributed to by other students. Bringing students together and letting them kind of do their own thing is gonna be extremely powerful in helping them establish a sense of community on campus. Groups or organizations was in second place. So it's not on administrators, it's not on navigators, it's not on other staff as much as maybe some offices would think that it is. It's really just providing the framework and the structure for students to collect together and, and providing the right support that they need in par as part of their groups and organizations. 
So hopefully I have set the stage uh, for, for the, uh, the keynote speaker here. But as we move forward and we look into the future, we have a, a lot more to go in terms of a deeper exploration into the student sense of community, belonging, and fit. Now that we know some of this, we can start to intervene on it. We can really dig into what these data actually represent and come up with better ways to measure this. And, and that includes surveys, focus groups, interviews, and, and other ways that we can collect data on students' sense of belonging and their fit. I, I advocate for letting students define what these terms are and suggestions for what to do. Because if we tell students how they're gonna belong and how they're gonna fit, we are not setting ourselves up for success. Let students describe what it's like to fit and what it's like not to fit because that, those will be just as informative uh, in, in both directions as we come up with some interventions on possibly enhancing the student's sense of belonging. We can continue looking at students who are not retained. You know, why, what, what could be some situations or some circumstances that lead students to not come back? Uh, the navigators have been fantastic at coming up with, you know, identification and, and reasons that students don't come back, and some of which we can impact. Some of them do point directly to this sense of belonging and fit. So how can we be impactful with the correct groups on campus looking at students who have not come back? This past year, we've also made some connections between student affairs offices and departments. We looked at who is engaging. Are they engaging with which offices? And we've actually put uh, names to engagement across a lot of student affairs offices so that we can see that you know, a specific student has engaged with Greek life and with athletics, and that's impact on retention. And we can tie that to their student satisfaction ratings as well. So we're at a point now where we're collecting a lot of engagement data and hoping to be able to move forward on what is really going to predict, at least in an informed way, whether or not students may be retained. And lastly, we need to bring it all together. We need to bring together the actual student experience and engagement data, co-op data, internship information, along with engagement with, with offices and, and um, departments across campus in student affairs. Academic data, right? Is it, is it GPA? Is it course sequence? Is it one class? Uh, along with the survey data, uh, all hopefully tying somehow to retention and whether or not students come back. So I'm at time um, and about to turn it over to Tom, but we do have a lot of information. We have all of our survey results posted on our website. We've got enrollment facts and figures for years now, retention and graduation rates broken out by race, ethnicity, and, and Pell status. Um, so all of that is available on our website, and we're happy to help and support as much as you can, and, and I'm excited at this point to turn it over to Tom, so thank you. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling better about retention already. <laughs> so it, it feels like we've established some momentum. So thank you, Eddie. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Glenn Davis. And so Glenn is currently the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs at Bowling Green State University. Prior to that, um, he arrived in December 2019. Prior to that, he was at St. Cloud State University where he began in the English department as an instructor, became the department chair, and then ultimately became the interim dean for the university college. And so Glenn and I met maybe March 2019. It's been about two, two and a half years, although we just met in person for the first time last night. But that's a common story that you hear, right? Oh, I just met them for the first time. But we've been talking, we've been corresponding, and. I had heard about Glenn through a colleague of his. And so this was early on in sort of the life of the Division of Student Success. And it was kind of overwhelming to think about the directives for student success, which were to increase the first to second year retention rate, to increase the six year graduation rate. And so I think for a number of us across the campus, it's a part of our job. But I think there's a responsibility that we all have, similar to what Edwin was saying, around the support of our students. And so what I loved about Glenn's work is that that was the first place and the first person from whom I had heard the language of belonging. And so Glenn, more specifically, has looked at academic belonging and social belonging. And so that really resonated. 
over dinner last night, we were talking, and, and similar to some of the data that Eddie has pointed out, that sometimes you don't know how connections are made. As an undergrad, uh, Glenn went to Harvard um, as one of four, believe it or not, bassoon players as in the first year class. Um, but he, he described the impact that a, that a professor had on him. And, and he continues to have this relationship with this professor who was not part of his major, not his advisor, but just an instructor of a class that really, that really resonated with Glenn. And he approached this professor to say, geez, can you help me learn Old English? And the professor happily took Glenn under his wing. And so it was just a great example of connections come from sometimes unpredictable places. I guess part of our role is how do we put some of those conversations, some of those points of connection in front of students where it becomes easier for them? Glenn, in this example, took the initiative. But how do we help those students who are willing to take the initiative, as well as those who might be a little bit more reticent? So again, really excited that Glenn is here. And so at this point, I'll turn it over to Glenn. And he's really going to focus his presentation on his work at St. Cloud State University. So Glenn, welcome. Thanks so much. Can you all hear me OK? Is the microphone, does it seem to be working? Yeah. Great. And are you OK if I have my, my mask off for this? I'll, I'll stay sort of out, out here as well. I appreciate it. I'm just going to get my presentation up. And again, thank you, Tom, Edwin, Dr. Bolden. I just really appreciate the invitation to come and speak with you today about some of my experiences at St. Cloud State University. So most of my time at Bowling Green State University, uh, as Tom mentioned, I started there right before the pandemic. So a lot of the work that we've been doing has been responding to just immediate needs. And what I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that some of the work that we did at St. Cloud State is now starting to, we're, we're finding some spaces where we can incorporate some of that work as well. By the way, is the sound better now? Is that good? You can hear me in the back? Okay, great, thank you. But when I was talking with Tom about my time at St. Cloud, um, and uh, as, as, as he mentioned, that this, this idea of belonging really resonated with our colleagues there. It's something that I think we recognize um, as having the potential for some really profound impact for our students. Though I take Eddie's points really well, we're, we're always looking for sort of what is that one thing that's gonna make that, that change for students? That's extremely hard to find. And I also wanna set the stage a little bit about St. Cloud State, where the demographic of our institution, we were primarily uh, an open access public four-year institution. And our retention rates historically were in the low, low to mid 60%, so fall to spring, so, uh, sorry, fall to fall, to our third semester. And we were losing around 500 students um, who had started in the fall of their first semester to those who were coming back in their third semester. So we were working with a, a, a set of students who um, were, were all completely capable of the work that, we were do, that, that they were doing but we had a really immediate need around enrollment to really try to make some, some changes that were going to have an impact. What we quickly learned, though, and something that I say a lot, I've said this already, I feel like a bit of a broken record with the folks I've talked to, is that retention is the ultimate lagging indicator, as is graduation rates. So that's after all decisions have been made. Students have faced any number of forks and, and not just two pronged. Often they have many decisions that they can make at any number of times over the course of their first semester, second semester, and so on. And that retention number that we all look at and that we know is so critical for reporting, for enrollment, for budget, um, really is, uh, as, as I said, it's, it's, the, it's the last decision that students make not to come back. So what can we learn about students well before any of those longer term decisions are being made that can have that broader impact. So those were some of the things that we were really looking at at St. Cloud. So what I'd like to do over the course of the session today is uh, talk a little bit about what belonging is and why it's important. Talk about what that meant for us at St. Cloud State and how we, we understood belonging as a way to bring a number of people from different parts of the university together. 
And then finally, we've got an exercise um, that we'll share out with the group. We have an opportunity to do some, some work together to try to identify some of those places where students may be receiving some signals that confirm a sense of belonging uncertainty on campus. And then identifying some short-term ways of addressing those, really just some immediate, what can you do right now in order to make some changes there? And then what are some structural changes that may need to occur in a medium or a longer term way that might require some deeper collaborations or some, some very, maybe some, some challenging conversations about some of the practices that we have. And again, I say this as an outsider to your campus, I know the outstanding work that's happening here. I've had a chance to learning from Tom and from Edwin and also just from uh, the, you know, the navigator work that you all are doing. And I know there's work happening across campus to improve student success. And I'm excited to hear from you about your response to some of this work and to see if you see some opportunities where you may be able to continue to improve student sense of belonging on campus. So that's sort of the broad overview of the presentation today. It should take around 30 to 35 minutes, which should leave us plenty of time to have some conversations at your table with some, uh, some of the handouts that I prepared. I would say too, if you have any questions or any ideas that you want to share as we're talking, by all means, just interrupt. So when we're thinking about sense of belonging, there's any number of definitions. I really prefer Terrell Strayhorn, uh, who's done a lot of work on sense of belonging. And just to, to sort of read this through very quickly, there's two sort of key elements here that I'm going to talk about. So uh, he says, in terms of college, sense of belonging refers to students' perceived social support on campus a feeling or sensation of connectedness, and the experience of mattering or feeling cared about, accepted, respected, valued by, and important to the campus community or others on campus, such as faculty, staff, and peers. It is a cognitive evaluation that typically leads to an affective and or behavioral response. So two key elements I just wanna focus on here. The first is that notion of mattering. What does it mean for students to matter on campus? Um, I, you know, uh, Eddie talked about really hearing from students, and we'll talk about some of the ways that we listen to students about what does it mean for you to matter on campus in a variety of different spaces, both academic, social, residential, and so on. The other really key point here is this cogn cognitive evaluation, that students are often if not always, sort of scanning their environments, looking at some of these signals that they do or don't belong on campus. And that's especially the case during points of transition, like their first time in college or maybe moving into a major. So they're looking for signs that they may or may not belong in that space. So that notion of belonging uncertainty can be exacerbated by some of those signals that they may be receiving. I'm not saying that those signals are intentional, but there may be some unintentional signals that could come in the form, for example, of a poorly worded email. I'll give an example. We, at St. Cloud State, we used a set of messaging that was probably hadn't been looked at in 15 years around students' academic progress. So students who were either on suspension or probation due to academic um, performance, the messaging was punitive. It was absolutely, it was not developmental. It wasn't understanding of the different kinds of challenges that students might be facing. And it didn't really, while it, pre it presented a transactional pathway forward, by doing X, Y, and Z, you'll be allowed to stay as part of our community. It didn't really take into account how a student might be feeling and receiving that. So a student who was already feeling as though they didn't belong on campus, that would, a signal like that would absolutely exacerbate that sense of uncertainty. So what can we do? What kind of signals are we putting out whether they're intentional or unintentional. I'm sure the person who originally created that message did not want to hurt that student or make them feel or confirm that they didn't belong on our campus, but that was the impact that we were having. So what are some of those signals that students might be receiving? It could even be the way that the campus is laid out or the way that, that wayfinding occurs. A student who can't find their way to a particular classroom or a student support office, that could also confirm a similar kind of sense of uncertainty that they already are feeling coming in that we're unwittingly exacerbating. Um, so that notion of, of mattering, I think, is really important. Uh, but that, that idea, again, about the cognitive evaluation that leads to the affective or behavioral response, for the student who feels as though they do belong on campus, um, that student is more likely to engage in the kinds of help-seeking behaviors that we know are gonna help them move forward, that they're more likely to see those obstacles or challenges as opportunities to get assistance and support, not as confirmation of something they already believe that they don't belong here, and as a sort of uh, almost like a, 
uh, an excuse to sort of withdraw, not necessarily from the university, but from the kinds of help and support that they might be receiving. So that notion that a sense of belonging, it's more than just feeling good. It's about leading to the kinds of behaviors or away from the kinds of behaviors that we believe are going to help students succeed. So a couple more slides just on belonging. Uh, and I think actually Eddie really set this presentation up really well. Thank you so much for that. So keeping in mind that a sense of belonging is not going to be the same for every student. And that, I think, goes almost without saying, but I just wanted to underscore this idea that a one-size-fits-all to belonging is, is um, not, likely not going to have the impact that, that we think it is. Really understanding, as you've already started to do with some of the, the, re the recent survey data that you're collecting, recognizing that students who come from lower socioeconomic back backgrounds, students from different race or ethnic backgrounds, students um, from LGBTQ plus communities, any number of different areas, and even keeping in mind within those areas, of course, we can't make generalizations either, that students are individuals, and we want to make sure that we're, we're thinking about that and taking that into account when thinking about sense of belonging more broadly. And then another slide that, that builds on the work that Eddie presented to you all just a few minutes ago is that the sense of belonging is dynamic, that for one student, uh, they may feel a sense of belonging in a classroom setting or in a major, but that same student might feel alienated in a residence hall environment. So how are we thinking um, uh, sort of broadly and across divisionally about different ways that different settings can impact student sense of belonging? So just because a student may say, yeah, I feel like I belong here, that student isn't necessarily feeling comfortable in every space. So how are we really thinking dynamically about sense of belonging overall? Why is it important? We've already started to talk about this a little bit. There are any number of research studies, and I have some handouts here, one of which includes a bibliography of resources that you might find useful that provide an overview of some of this material, and we'll hand that out before the end of the class, the class, the session today. Um, but uh, there uh, is, is, is lots and lots of research that indicates uh, that broad statement that Terrell Strayhorn made at the beginning around um, uh, sense of belonging being this, this uh, it, it's a cognitive response that does lead to behaviors. So we want to ensure that students uh, feel the sense of belonging because it will lead to them taking advantage of the kinds of support that will help them succeed. I wanted to move away from some of the research studies, and I'll be referring to one, one more though in just a, just a minute, but I'm not sure if any of you recall an article that was published in the New York Times Magazine in 2014 by Paul Tuff. It was called, Who Gets to Graduate? Does that ring a bell with, with anybody in the room? It was a, a, a kind of a bellwether article. This was you know seven or so years ago, and I say bellwether because um, this work on belonging had been happening for, for years, and I, we were talking last night about uh, Tinto and Claude Steele and many others have been working for decades on the importance of student belonging and integration. It's not as though it wasn't something that folks in educational research and student affairs weren't interested in or studying. But this article really sort of brought it to a, a, a national focus. And Paul Tuff talks about it and it starts with a really sort of striking image of, of a college student her name's Vanessa who was um, uh, really a, a standout student in her high school. She graduated near the top of her class, was admitted to the University of Texas at Austin in the nursing program, and really thought that she was going to be very successful. She had every indicator that she was going to be successful. When she made that transition, when she sort of moved into that new space, she started realizing that, that what made her kind of stand out at her high school was really common to everybody else, and that she didn't have the kind of um, sort of command over her academic performance that she did in high school. And she received a, a bad grade on a, I believe it was a statistics midterm sort of early on, that for her was kind of confirming what she was already seeing, that she really wasn't meant to be here, that she wasn't capable of doing this work. Of course, that was not the case at all. And what Tuff says, um, uh, you know, they get to a good college, encounter what should be a minor obstacle, something like a bad grade or uh, maybe receiving some criticism uh, on an essay, something that is really common to any student. But because of her belonging uncertainty at the time, um, that led her into a cycle of sort of withdrawing and not seeking out help and sort of retreating further and further, which was really just exacerbating the situation that she, that she was in rather than sort of seeking out that help. 
So things spiral, and before they know it, they're back at home, resentful, demoralized, and in debt. And we know this happens to many of our students. And I, I really appreciate the work that's happening here, where your, your retention rate is extremely strong. How are we sort of you know, how are you sort of moving that forward? But also, you, th it looked like there were some opportunities more broadly, especially in that third year retention rate and that graduation rate. Um, it may not be in the first to second year where students are experiencing this here, but there may be some other spaces where students have some of this opportunity. So one of the studies that Tuff refers to in this essay is the work of uh, David Yeager, who was at Stanford working with Carol Dweck and some others um, and then moved on to the University of Texas at Austin, where he still is. And he conducted a study over uh, a number of years that was intending to try to normalize belonging uncertainty at key points of transition, and then um, provide students with uh, sort of this understanding that they, what they're experiencing is really common. That when you move into a new situation, when you move into a new university, as a first year student, it's really normal for you to feel as though you're not connecting to people, you are um, uh, not capable of doing the academic work. So he did a, a pre-entry, um, are, are you familiar with the work that David Yeager has done here? Uh, I know that we've talked about it a little bit, but uh, it's referred to as kind of an inoculation, which I think at the time also had a very different sort of valence. This was all very much pre-COVID. Um, and, and in fact, I think inoculation is really not an accurate way of describing what he's doing, but he is, is helping students during their summer orientation, before they ever set foot on campus, um, learn about a theory of belonging, really a lay theory of belonging, so that they can come in knowing that it's normal to experience some of these challenges and then find some ways around it. And found, in fact, that students in this study, in particular students from, from um, underestimated populations, were... Um, uh, achieved higher GPAs. He was not looking at retention in this case, but looking at GPA and academic performance and found higher GPAs for students who had experienced this versus those who had not. And there's been a number of studies and, and uh, sort of offshoot studies from this um, since, and there's been some challenges to this work as well. That's where that inoculation comes in, that that one sort of shot that students get the summer before they arrive really is not necessarily enough to sort of carry them through all four years. But what it did is it, it, uh, it really provided some empirical evidence to demonstrate that students who understand that these transitions are normal are more likely to be successful down the road, which I think is really, really critical. So just to, to recap, and I've said this a number of times now, but thinking about belonging not just as it is the right thing to do. We want our students to feel as though they fit on campus, that they have a place here, that they belong here. But we're also doing it because we believe that it's going to help them achieve the goals that they've set for themselves and, and seek out those kinds of um, supports and activities that are going to help them stay engaged on campus. Okay, so pausing now, I want to switch uh, gears a little bit and talk about what we did at St. Cloud State, which we called our belonging project. <clears throat> so this work began in 2016, and St. Cloud State, uh, as I mentioned, we were largely an, an access institution with a relatively low first to second year retention rate. There were a lot of opportunities for us to make some improvements there, which we knew. And we had been trying everything. We had a bit of a kitchen sink approach to student success and retention. We tried to uh, change the way that we advised students. We changed the way that we did our residence life programming. We provided additional scholarship dollars. We had any number of activities that we were doing. And I'm not sure if that resonates at all, sort of where you have a bunch of different things happening, but we weren't exactly sure of the impact of any of them. And we also weren't necessarily aligning our work. And we also were working very much in silos, that we had a very active student affairs unit that was doing excellent work. We had our academic advising units. We had our financial aid units. We had residence life, which was really doing its own thing, even though it was part of student affairs. We were not all working in the same direction. <clears throat> So in 2016, St. Cloud State joined what was called the Reimagining the First Year Project, which was out of the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. And its primary goal was to answer a really big question that made us uncomfortable and also really excited. So the first, the, that main question is, what would the first year look like if students really mattered? What would the first year look like if students really mattered? 
And that was a hard question. I'm seeing some responses here because I think that we all believe that our students matter. There's no question, we wouldn't be here, right, if we didn't believe our students mattered. And um, I was really grateful for that question. That came from George Mahaffey, who was the Vice President for Academic Affairs at ASCU at the time. He's since retired. And that question sits with me pretty much every day. We're thinking about that. You, you, can, you can look at that from a number of different lenses, from an academics lens, from a student support lens, from how do we engage in hiring on our campuses? How do we engage in professional development? What does our tenure and promotion process look like if students really matter? It, it's a big question for us to ask. And it's one that, again, I think about I mean, every day for the last five years since I originally heard it. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the keynote speaker for that event was David Yeager, the author of that study that I mentioned, who was, was highlighted in Paul Tuff's uh, article. So I'm just sort of bringing a, a couple of these things together. And that resonated for us on campus. Uh, we had just a small group that was officially part of the organization, uh, the Reimagining the First Year cohort. But it was our goal and our task to bring that work back to campus and find a way to start having some serious conversations about aligning our approach to student success. And not just kind of nibbling around the edges or not just launching another initiative, but really trying to answer that question. What would that first year look like if students really mattered? We wanted to find a way that would, to answer that question that would also not be as overwhelming as it could be because it's clearly a, a big one. So for us, we, uh, we heard that keynote from David Yeager. A number of us had seen some of that work previously or read that article uh, from 2014 that I mentioned. And we decided that belonging would be the foundation of the work that we did, that that was one of the ways that we were gonna start to answer that question. What would the first year look like if students really mattered? We're gonna pay some really close attention to how we think about belonging on our campus. So that required a lot of work. We did not have really any buddy who had been talking about that previously. We certainly had student affairs experts, and I had a chance to talk with, with Dr. Gerda, who I know uh, has worked with. Um, we have a number of folks, including our vice president for student affairs at St. Cloud State. Uh, so I was, I was really happy to make that connection this morning. So we had people who were well-trained, highly trained, and successful in student success and student support. What we didn't have was a common definition of what we were trying to accomplish or a definition of any of the problems we were trying to solve. So by bringing some of these things together, this was one of our goals, is let's create a common language around this and a common mission and a common belief that we're gonna be able to have an impact on our first year students. So what we wanted to learn uh, through our participation in that Reimagining the First Year project is um, what can our institution do to learn more about individual students' sense of belonging? We were convinced that belonging was gonna be important for us, um, but we wanted to know to learn as much about it as we could, as early as we could, to make some decisions, uh, sorry, to, to make some interventions that would allow us to hopefully impact students' uh, decisions to stay. Again, when I talk about retention as that lagging indicator, what are some of the things that we can learn about early about our individual students that can help us intervene in ways that are going to be effective um, and useful for those students and meaningful? We wanted to do this, though, in a in a way that was a little bit different from how our student success initiatives had, had sort of emerged previously, which was very much in pockets across campus. We had an honors program that was doing work. I already mentioned some of these as well. We wanted to take a, a broader, um, more holistic approach to student support because we also believe that that would show students that we thought that they mattered by really looking to students, and, and I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the focus groups that we, we had as well. So we, we listened to students too when we started talking about belonging. I take that point very seriously that, that Eddie said earlier that we think we might know what it means for students to belong. And, and there's lots of research that indicates that we can make some good guesses, but we also wanna make sure that we're working within the specific milieu of our students. So we were really interested in seeing if we could break down some of the barriers, the artificial barriers that existed between and among different divisions on our campus, which had been there for many years. And uh, we were not, uh, I mean, everybody was very friendly with each other. It's not as though these things were broad territory wars or anything like that. But we just weren't all working together in ways that we thought could be useful. So these were some of the questions that helped to guide our work. So one of the first things that we did to um, address that first question, is there a way that we can actually learn about 
individual student sense of belonging early enough that we can hopefully have an impact on making some changes to it. So we were fortunate. I'm going to try to speed through this a little bit. I'm happy to answer some questions, though, if there's, uh, uh, if there's some, some um, uh, you know, additional ideas or questions. And I should say, too, uh, we, we had a small group that I worked with on the survey in particular, including um, colleagues from institutional research, from our departments of math and statistics. We had some faculty really helping us with this. I was the medievalist of the group. That was sort of my area, so I contributed what I could, um, but uh, really interested in, in hearing sort of your, your understanding of some of, of what we did here. We had, uh, are you familiar with the MapWorks Sky Factor survey? Do you use that on campus here or have you ever? So it's a, it's a large survey. It's about a 200 plus question survey. Uh, it takes about 45 minutes for students to complete. And it gives you tons of information, a lot of what you were talking about um, in, during your presentation. We had been giving that presentation, uh, sorry, that survey for many years, but really not doing much with it. We collected the data and we kind of let it sit. So when we started looking at belonging, we dug into that survey to identify a small subset of questions that were connected most to questions. We looked at both social and academic belonging, as Tom indicated. I'm going to be talking today really about our social belonging, because that's what we found in the short term was having the biggest impact on student retention. And we identified five factors within this much broader survey um, that in our historical data, we could positively connect to students' persistence to second semester and retention to their third semester. So we were able to dive into that historical data as a way of identifying if we were going to create maybe a more nimble survey that we could give out, not this 200 behemoth question behemoth, but something that we could give much more quickly, um, what would be those questions? And then we re-ran those same data with just these factors and found that we were able to get down to about 10, not to about, to 10 questions that were most closely linked to students' persistence and retention behavior historically on our campus. Recognizing that that may not predict future behavior, but at least gave us a good starting point. And they were questions associated with, um, with these five factors. We were a primarily residential campus. Is Case, is Case a residential campus for first and second year? Okay, and maybe even beyond third and fourth as well? Okay, great. So we recognize that in, in some cases, if a student was a, maybe a post-traditional student who was living off campus, getting a survey question that said, do you think about going home much of the time, they might think, I live at home with my family and my children, right? So that may be a signal that they don't belong, right? That we're not catering to that group of students. So we were sensitive to that factor as well in the way that we distributed the survey. And what we found, um, uh, as I indicated, and, and I can just sort of quickly go through here, it will not be surprising uh, for you to see, I'm not sure uh, if you can see this, that SBI is our social belonging index, is what that refers to. We have a high, middle, and low grades of that based on quartiles, the top quartile, the middle two, and then the bottom. And then we also looked at students who didn't take our survey at all. Um, and we found, unsurprisingly, that students uh, who had a, a low sense of belonging were far less likely to return. It confirmed what we thought, but it was, it was good to actually see this data in practice. This is both the historical data and then since we started, um, uh, uh, since we started using our, our actual students who were with us, uh, with us there. One of the other things we found that was surprising to us and challenged some of the ways that we thought about student success in our outreach program is that uh, social belonging and GPA were not correlated. And again, this is, may, may not be surprising to you, but it was good for us to see this um, in front of us because what it suggested is we had to rethink some of the ways that we were doing our outreach. That one of the ways that we and, uh, and many other campuses try to predict students' likelihood of returning is based on their, often their pre-college um, indicators, ACT, SAT, and GPA, and of course their first and second, their first and second semester GPAs. What we found is that um, those two things were not, social belonging and their GPA were not connected. So we would often look at a student who had a higher GPA or had higher factors coming in and be less likely to intervene with that student because they would think, well, they had a 1300 on their, AC, on their SAT and they came in with a 3.8 and they had good midterm grades. We're not gonna worry about them. We're gonna focus our energy somewhere else. This showed us that belonging 
and, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second, but that belonging impacted students with higher GPAs as much as it did students with lower GPAs, and those higher GPA students were also not returning at a rate that we would anticipate. So it really helped us get a better understanding of some of the specific challenges our students were facing, and it gave us, it rendered a challenge that was largely invisible to us, visible. And I say invisible, that's really thinking institutionally. There would have been, there may have been individual folks, an advisor, a faculty member, a student support member who knew that that student wasn't connecting to us. But we didn't have any way of understanding that on any broader scale. So that was kind of left up to chance whether or not they were connected to an individual on campus who would be able to help and intervene. So this gave us a way of kind of understanding something more about our students that was new. We also found that there were a number of contributing factors. As um, Dr. Bolden indicated, we, like many campuses, were looking at race and ethnicity. We were looking at Pell eligibility. We were looking at distance from home as some of our key indicators. Um, and we had a number of retention initiatives and campaigns that were dedicated to working with students in these different groups. What we found is that when we added social, low social belonging to these other factors, that there was a, an, a, a, a deeply exacerbating impact for these folks. So if we, if we don't take belonging into account, which for many, many years we didn't, we just looked at Pell eligibility, for example, and there was a 75% uh, retention for students who weren't and a 65% who were. We were at about 40% Pell eligibility on my campus. When you factor in low social belonging, um, not only does the, uh, certainly both go down, but the, the gap widens a bit. And we see that happening even more um, with our uh, students of color and also uh, even more so with students who are far from home. And we define that as having another four-year university um, uh, more than 40 miles away. So we, we had a, a sort of institutional definition of what far from home and close to home meant. So you can see that, that, these, uh, that adding social belonging to our understanding of some of these other um, factors that we were already looking at really gave us a, a much better understanding of, of where we had the opportunity to improve. So as I mentioned, we, we use this information to develop uh, a, a shorter survey that we were able to conduct mobily for students. Um, these are just some screenshots, and I'd be really happy also to share the questions if that would be useful. I'm not sure if that's something that would be useful for the group. We've shared them with a number of institutions um, uh, as well and, and are working with, uh, with several of them and learning from them as they work to refine this work. This is meant to be open access, so we're very happy to share. Uh, but we found that, that creating a mobile survey that we were able to um, uh, I was talking with Eddie just before the, the talk today. It's hard to get students to take surveys, even a short one like this. But you've got, for example, navigators, and there's any number of ways that you could could increase sort of uh, this uh, the the completion rate for a survey like this. Um, and we would give this survey in between weeks three and five of the semester, which we know is really critical for the transition for students and being able to, uh, they're starting to make connections or not make connections, they're starting to engage or not engage with different activities on campus. So that was a really good time for us to be able to um, sort of capture that snapshot of student social belonging at that moment in time. So we had a couple of responses to this, ways to respond to this survey as well. And one of these was triage that this was information that we had simply not been collecting before. And there was an open-ended question on the survey where students could just indicate that they needed additional support. And we had indicated to students at the beginning of the survey that someone may reach out to them based on their responses. So they knew that outreach was a possibility. This was not an um, anonymous, uh, uh, this was not a confidential survey that they were completing. So if students indicated something that was concerning, we reached out to them immediately. And there's one that I will never forget, where a student said, I feel like I'm drowning every day. I feel like I'm drowning every day. And this is in week four or five of the semester. And I think about it, this was in 2017. And we, it made us think about all the students who didn't have the space to indicate that as well, um, and how many of them may have really been struggling and this was an outlet or an opportunity for them and, and someone was asking them how they felt at that moment. So we worked with our colleagues in student affairs, in residence life, in our counseling center 
to get immediate triage to students who, who, um, who indicated a need for assistance or help. And then if there were things that seemed less urgent, like I'm having questions about my finances, right, we were able to make those kinds of connections as well. We also partnered with our peer wellness coaches. We were fortunate to have a group of uh, masters uh, students in social work and school counseling who were really interested and excited to work with us on this project. So they did some immediate outreach to these students as well and had training uh, th that was specific to the kinds of um, questions that the students might have around getting connected and, and, uh, and those questions about belonging uncertainty on campus. And we're very fortunate to work with those. Uh, and as I mentioned, before any of this happened, we also worked with students. We had a number of focus groups with students from first year up through senior to, to talk to them a little bit about belonging and why we thought it was important. We wanted to hear from them where they felt like they did and didn't belong on campus and how they'd want someone to reach out to them if they indicated that they had that diminished sense of belonging. Because we didn't want to, um, we knew it couldn't be a one size fits all approach. We really wanted to hear from students' voices themselves about how they would, how they would want to be reached out to. Would that upset you if someone said, I understand that you may not be feeling connected to campus, what can we do to help? So we didn't want to further alienate students who were already feeling tenuous about their positions on campus. So those were some of the immediate things that we did with this information that we gathered um, from students during that critical transition time. So as I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, we wanted to know early enough how students were feeling connected to campus so that we'd be able to intervene. What we also wanted to do, and I'm gonna sort of shift gears a little bit here, I'm conscious of the time, I know I'm going a little bit over, but hopefully we'll have enough time for the present. We have till 11, is that right? I promise not to talk until like 10.55. I, will, I think I'll wrap up in about 10 minutes. Um, so we also knew that we had an opportunity because people were, for the first time in a while, sharing an understanding of not only the definition of our problem, right? When we talk about student success, and I've heard this already come up today, it's, it, it may feel like it's everybody's job and it's nobody's job, right? That it's, it can be very hard to sort of pinpoint whose responsibility. I know that at Case, you've taken some really clear and intentional institutional steps in order to um, move that forward. We hadn't at St. Cloud State. That was not something that we had done. Student success was fairly diffuse. So while we, we knew that we were now at least understanding more about our students and some of their specific needs, on campus, um, we also wanted to take this opportunity to really push and get back to that question, what would the first year look like if students really mattered? So one of the things that we wanted to do, and we heard from students in that focus group, was that they often felt like they were getting inconsistent information from the student support offices they were going to, or they were felt like they were often being passed from one office to another, and that people, there was no real shared understanding or network that was helping get students connected to the resources they need. There were referrals being made, no question about that. But there wasn't really a, a sense that students really mattered as that process was going forward. So one of the things that we did, and this was one of the more structural changes that we enacted, was to develop a team uh, of existing personnel that had already been working together, but not in as intentional a way as we believed that they could. So we had an academic advising team we uh, a, pers a group of professional staff who worked with first year students already. We had an outstanding financial aid team uh, and we also had a career center. Um, these folks were working together. We also knew that these were three elements uh, that, that what was represented in each of those three spaces, um, that is academic planning and support, um, ability to continue to afford, you know, persistence and retention at that institution, and then understanding really a sense of purpose from a very early age, and, and recognizing that while your career may change, aspirations may change, really getting students understanding that they have some agency and efficacy around that notion of career, the earlier we, we were able to provide that to them, the better off we would be. So we were fortunate structurally. Um, Tom mentioned that I was an interim dean of our university college, which was our student success space primarily. And through a happy accident that I had nothing to do with, um, we had academic advising, which makes sense. We also had financial aid. I was never able to figure that out because that's a pretty unusual 
connection. Usually that's in maybe an enrollment management area or in, uh, where is financial aid here at Case Western? Where does it sit? Enrollment management. Um, in some places it's in finance and administration. It can be in a number of places. It's rarely in an academic affairs unit where we were. So I was just really grateful for that and had outstanding partners in those spaces. So we brought the leaders of the three groups together um, and then quickly went out to everybody else. And we said, well, what would it look like if we were able to create a network for students so that they're assigned to a team of you? So rather than have an advisor having a caseload, it was now a team having a caseload, um, which took some doing. Uh, but we were able to reach across some, some boundaries. So the, the Career Counseling Center, for example, was in our student affairs area. So we were able to work with our vice president for student affairs and get folks on board, the leaders of each of these units on board, to develop uh, uh, really a sort of a, a practice and a community of practice where they were now all working together. So we used, functionally, we used the advisor as the sort of main person. So students were assigned to the advisor and then the advisor was assigned to two other of those, uh, a, a member from financial aid and a member from career. So it isn't just when they're meeting with an academic advisor, go see your financial, go see financial aid, just head over there. But I'd like you to go see Tara over in financial aid. I provided her this information that you shared with me. We used a um, navigate, EAB's navigate. Do you all have a system like a CRM for, is it navigate here? Salesforce. Salesforce. So there's a way for folks to share information across units. And we had a protocol there too, so that students wouldn't need to repeat what they, they said in one place, so that the handoff was really more of a, of a uh, it was more of a network than it was go see this office and they might see Tara on one day and uh, John on another and so on, but they were going to see Tara. That was their person that they were going to see who knew their financial, cha what challenges they were facing. And then uh, there were regular meetings among the team to identify students of concern as well. So we found a way to build some structures that showed students that they mattered, that we were listening to the students and doing that work and also helped that group really bring together uh, work together in some ways that were new for them. And if you'll indulge me just a minute, I want to talk about some of the, an, an unintended outcome that came, came about as a result of this work. So we have a, a summer advising program for our new students. We called it Advising and Registration Days. Is there an equivalent here where students come to campus and they get registered for classes like online? Okay. So there's a roadmap. And that happens in the summer before they arrive. Perfect. And then is there a summer orient and then there's orientation when they come to campus right before classes. Perfect. We have a similar one, although we did ours in person. We're mostly drawing students from our region, so we were able to do that. So and it was a big event for us. It's the first chance we really have, other than campus visits, to welcome students to our facility. And historically, advising was the center stage. You'd walk up into our ballroom, and it was really about advising. And we literally had around the periphery. Uh, a kind of resource, set of resource tables, and financial aid and career along with many other groups were in that area. Since we started folks working together as part of this team to try to improve student um, uh, sense of belonging and also get them connected to their resources more effectively, uh, they came to me with an idea of a way of centering both financial aid and career at advising, all three of them came, the three groups together, had an idea for sort of reconfiguring the way that we thought about our advising and registration orientation for students in the summer that, um, that didn't really privilege any one of those units, but really was more acknowledging from a student experience some of the things that they may be experiencing coming in. So I have just some pictures here that may or may not really indicate what's happening. Uh, this, this one here, that's it right right before students go into our ballroom, and this is our career center, I'll talk about that in just a second, and then our financial aid officer right inside, and I'll talk about uh, Mike Uran, and we were red and black, uh, in the red and black right there. So the first thing that students would, would see now, and this is still the case, is uh, they would work with members of our career center, uh, and they would ask students coming up, what you know, students had indicated that they had a major or that they were still deciding. But that was pretty much all we did previously is we would indicate, all right, so a student is either has a major or does not have a major. And what they wanted to do as a way of helping to improve students' sense of belonging and normalize some of that uncertainty they may feel, um, they normalized major uncertainty, that they created an exercise that was designed to very quickly get a snapshot of student interests. It was just a really brief, almost like a personality test 
to help students who had questions about their major, which was quite common for the students that we were working with, even if they came in with a major. And then they were able to then, I, on the back half of this sheet, this was done um, all live, with one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So this, the student didn't just have to fill this out. It was done through concert, con conversation. Um, on the back, they would then suggest some areas, uh, some disciplines that the students might be interested in. Oh, it sounds like you're interested in learning more about working with people, so we might recommend a sociology course. Um, so, and then they, they were armed with that when they went to their advisor. They were able to say, you know what, I just had a meeting, did a very quick scan of some things I might be interested in, and this might help inform our advising conversation. So it let students know that it was okay not to know what they wanted to do, and that there was someone there to not only prepare to listen to them, but actually had something that could help them move forward. The other thing that we did with our financial aid was recognizing that this is a pretty opaque process for many of our students. Um, not, all of our, not all of our students would come to this event with a parent or a guardian. Some of them would come by themselves. So here they are 17, 18 years old, maybe fully responsible for financing their own education. And then we would often give them either a pretty generic presentation about financial aid, about what a Pell Grant is, and about you know, um, how to read your bill and these kinds of things. But that was about it. And then the bundling letter that we used to send was pretty, I mentioned earlier about some of the unintentional signals that we often send to our students. It, it was, uh, as someone who was, you know, I, I've been in higher ed a very long time. I've seen a number of financial aid kinds of documents, but it was, they're difficult to unpack. And a lot of students have a lot of questions based on these documents. So they developed, we called it the break it down sheet, the bid sheet, which was an opportunity for um, our folks. And we worked with students on this as well to sort of make this more transparent. And we indicated, uh, it really just laid out in fairly clear language exactly what everything was doing, not in a letter format, but really in an easy to read grid. And then indicated what their estimated remaining balance was. Um, and that was it, total charges, total aid. I know this looks, it seems like a pretty, we, we were simply not doing this, that our financial aid office, they were doing excellent work that was fully in compliance, but it didn't really have the student in mind. So how can we sort of rethink some of this? And that picture I showed you of my former colleague, Mike, over here on the right, this is our director of financial aid, and what he's got there are all the bid sheets. So everybody had their individual bid sheet they were given on that day. We had them prepared for each day. We knew which students were coming to the event. And then his team is actually circulating right now. Members of that student success team in, on the financial aid side are circulating throughout, at, answering questions one-on-one, -on -one, finding time at the tables to meet with students and families individually. Um, and then when they had that presentation that was for everybody, that more generic presentation, it took on a completely different valence because these students had a much clearer understanding of what the financial implications were. So I, I, I took that four or five minute digression because this was not something that we had planned as part of our belonging uh, project. But because we were bringing people together who were experts in working with students, they were able to come up with ideas that really changed the way that we engage students right from the very beginning of welcoming them onto campus. So we were really gratified to see some of these unintended consequences, but really happy ones coming out. And then finally, and this is the last slide, and then we can get on to some of, our pres uh, some of the workshop, is really thinking about faculty's role in this process. I know we have a number of faculty here today, and as I mentioned, my background is in faculty. I had a very traditional faculty background up until I started learning more about um, um, this reimagining the first year work. And we, we knew that uh, we wanted our faculty to play as important a role in helping students feel as though they belonged on campus as everybody else. And we looked at our faculty who were spending, students spend the majority of their time with our faculty members on campus and really engaging faculty in this work. We did work with faculty leadership first to um, sort of talk to them about what our goals were and then talk about some ideas we had about finding ways to engage them. Uh, one of the ways that we did this is, uh, is faculty became some of our outreach partners. So we often use our student support folks to do the kind of outreach. And, and I'm not sure about the, the culture here at, at, at Case Western. I would love to hear maybe during some of the questions uh, if we have a chance to talk about it. But we simply, we hadn't really asked faculty to reach directly out to students. And part of the reason for that is that we never really had a, a good reason why. But with this belonging survey that we had we're now, um, uh, we've instituted, we, we knew that students who were maybe on the, the 
we started this way, and I think that had I stayed, uh, and the work is still going on, uh, there may be some additional options here, but I'll just tell you about what we, what we did, is we wanted faculty to connect with students who were in their majors who were experiencing a low sense of belonging, but had higher academic, um, uh, a higher academic profile. So students who were coming in maybe with higher GPA and ACT scores and who had really performed well in particular in that first semester. So in that second semester, we had faculty reach out to students. So for example, we had some of our psychology faculty reaching out to students in the psychology major. These were second semester first year students who were low on the belonging scale, but high on the academic scale to talk to them about getting them maybe involved in a project in their department or welcoming them to a symposium on campus. Something that we felt our faculty might be comfortable with because they're not often, um, you know, they were, they were not trained in student support or student development theory, but they were comfortable talking about their disciplines and welcoming students into those disciplines. So finding ways to really connect with them on that level. One of the other things we did is we held a series of workshops with faculty. Um, we ended up with around 40 faculty members participating, and I actually have this as a handout for you as well. And uh, we wanted our faculty to think about what it would, uh, again, with this question of what would that first year look like if students really mattered, what do our first year classes look like if student, students really matter? And we know that there are much bigger questions about the, the um, delivery and the pedagogy that we were not gonna be able to get into as part of this project, though had I remained, we, certain, we certainly were heading in that direction. But we were even thinking about, well, what does the first week look like if students really matter? And getting, getting our faculty to think about ways that they could welcome students into this space, um, that they could maybe try to identify some of those unintentional signals that might be confirming a student's belonging uncertainty and try to dispel those or turn those around in ways um, that could hopefully welcome students in and let them know that their concerns were, were normal and typical and also something that could be overcome. So we kind of seeded the conversation with a couple of, of, of ideas. Um, but for example, um, and, and then really just let the faculty go. And they developed a, a, a pretty great toolkit that then got used as part of our training with our new faculty moving forward. Um, one of the things we did, for example, was how to introduce yourself. So if faculty felt comfortable doing so, maybe talking about their own transition into college and some of the challenges that they faced. Um, did they ever struggle in uh, a course that they took and how did they uh, overcome that to sort of really um, humanize their own experience and let students know that that's something that's really quite common um, is, is one of the ways they could do that. Uh, not taking for granted that students knew how to connect with other students. I think that we often talk about study groups as really a, and we know it's, it's, it's an effective way of getting students to connect. What are faculty doing actually to facilitate that? Are they passing around sheets that say, all right, we're gonna form some study groups. I'm gonna give each of you, I'm gonna give you all five minutes to meet two or three other people to exchange information so that you can then connect. Really simple things. This is nothing really earth shattering that we're talking about. But not only is that beneficial, but it just, we hoped would signal to the student that the faculty member is really thinking about them and their success in ways that might extend beyond the discipline. And we found this was really resonated with our faculty. They, they were really engaged with this process and excited to, to, to participate. So again, as I mentioned, I have a workshop worksheet here that I'll hand out with some of what they came up with, but that might be a, a way to, to look more broadly. And again, this is not to say that belonging is the only thing that's going to impact student success. We know that students might be having challenges academically. They could be having challenges financially. There's any number of different, different issues that they may be facing. But what, what belonging did for us at St. Cloud State is it really helped to bring together uh, a, a group of really remarkable and talented people who were not talking to each other about this issue. And then to be more intentional about some of the ways that we were able to move forward, we did see early gains in our retention. I don't wanna say that this fixed everything. I've not been connected since then. We definitely saw early gains in our retention, but we, didn't, we weren't able to do all the impact study. Uh, I don't wanna suggest to you that this was somehow the magic bullet for us. But I would argue that even if it didn't have that ultimate impact on our retention, what it did for our team on campus and for the way that it was able to shift the way that we talked about student success and then we talked about students mattering on our campus, that was something, as I said, we had folks who believed that, no question, across our campus. We didn't really have a shared mission about that. And that, for me, is, is far more important than the specific retention numbers that we were going to achieve, especially in the short term. 
those are going to fluctuate. Those are going to move up and down for a variety of reasons. Um, but what we really wanted to do was to get people really letting our students know that they mattered to us and getting folks really on the same page. So that's, that's all I have for the presentation. I know I, I talked longer than I had anticipated, but there's certainly time for some questions, and I would love for us, if you're open to it, to do some brainstorming about some of those things that might be, might be happening on, our, on your campus that could be addressed in a similar kind of manner. So would, would we prefer to maybe move right on to the workshop and then maybe see if we have some time for concluding questions afterwards? So this, this handout that, uh, and thank you uh, for, for helping pass that out, this is an opportunity for folks at your tables, and I'm not sure how you're all seated, if, if maybe there's some cross-divisional partnerships here, or if you're all from the same units, or does it, is it kind of mixed? It's mixed, okay, and that's just fine for, for what we're gonna be doing today. So this is just an opportunity to start thinking about maybe some of those um, signals, unintentional, that students might be receiving that could be impacting or exacerbating a sense of belonging uncertainty on your campus. So the first step is really to think about what those might be. And I've given you a couple of examples already. So I talked about, um, uh, I, I talked about our financial aid paperwork. I talked about our satisfactory academic progress paperwork. There may be any number of other signals on campus. There could be some that are physical, the way that, that the campus is laid out. That's not gonna be an easy fix, obviously. Um, but there could be wayfinding issues. These could also be, and I think very much about uh, sort of virtual spaces. How are students connecting, which I know so much. Uh, are you all teaching primarily in person now, or is there still a hybrid, or is it in person? Um, so so th there may be, um, if there are any sort of vestiges of, of our, our COVID interaction, what are some of those signals? Uh, they could be policies or practices. What are they? Um, and then the second column is, is more of a, of a challenge, and I recognize that this may not be possible, but are there some things that you could do even this week to start to address some of these? So some of these might be relatively easy to address. Um, the answer may be no, to be, to pay, depending on the ones that you come up with, but are there some things that could actually be done like just immediately and with relatively little fanfare that would be able to address those things? And then um, whose partnership and collaboration would you need in order to be successful? So starting to think really cross-divisionally, and I, got, I, know, I know a lot of this is already happening here, so please don't take this to, to think that I, I don't think that. Uh, and then finally, are there any um, longer-term strategies that you might be able to identify that could address some of these barriers? So recognizing that the short fix might work for one or two things, but if you chose maybe this satisfactory academic progress, what are some of the longer term strategies that you might be able to enact in order to make some of those changes? So why don't you just take a little bit of time, maybe even 10, 15 minutes to start to think through some of these things. Um, and even if we don't get past the first two columns, that'll be okay. We can, uh, we can address some of those at a, a later time. Thanks. So hopefully you had enough time to at least get a conversation started at your table about some of these signals. And we've got an opportunity, I'd love to hear um, uh, from as many of you as possible about maybe we can start with some of the signals that you identified that students might be receiving, um, just to sort of maybe uh, use that as a way to begin that discussion. So I, we, any, any table, anybody who'd like to start? Thank you. Thanks, Ed. All right, well, I'll keep the mic. Um, so part of what we talked about, um, which was a, a, more of a question that I also had, um, was a correlation between representation of identities that are identified on our campus and the sense of belonging. And the, and the reason we say that is we think about the communities of our international students, our LGBT students, our, our, our women identified students, our underrepresented students, and if they don't see representation, do they then want to stay, right? In the sense of, and also looking at safety in the sense that we were, and Kathy had mentioned, around the recent um, armed robberies on campus and how a lot of our black students, when they heard that they're gonna be increasing police presence, they're like, oh, hell no, we're not gonna be here. Like, let's go, gotta go, because I'm not getting arrested or being profiled, right? And so those are the things that I, we often think about where this um, sense of belonging happens. Are we identifying these areas where the messaging that we're sending may be a trigger to some of our 
underrepresented identified communities. Um, and then ways that we talked about um, being a way to solve that, one is the messaging that we send. So an example for OMA, Multicultural Affairs, where I am, um, we purposely signal students that they feel a sense of belonging. So something that identifies from their, their country of origin, their cul culture or customs, um, we tell them you don't have to police your language. So it's like, if you're speaking in your native tongue, that is fine, because this, this is your space. Um, if you have to have a discussion that is something that's maybe a little harsh, that's fine. Have that conversation. We can dialogue. But we signal those that, com that communication to our students that that's okay for them to be there, right? So they don't have to worry about the putting a face to one or code switching in our space. But part of that is to let them know at, even with all of the other things that you are discussing, which were great, but looking at like, how do we signal to them of their own individual selves that it's okay that you show up as yourself and not having to put on this cultural community piece of, I have to form a conformant to Case Western Reserve and not be myself. Such a, such a great point. And, um, and that, that broader notion of representation is, a, is, is clearly a signal and there's, uh, and, and again, uh, an unintentional one, but you talked about the idea of, of how students navigate their identities and, and how can we signal to them that, they're, that, that being themselves, right, and being comfortable in themselves is absolutely critical to their, that's, that's a great point, thank you. Anybody else? So our, our table discussed a variety of different things, but the one thing I wanted to point out was jumping ahead to the, the fourth box, what are some longer term strategies? And one of the things that came to mind was how a lot of what we do in terms of reporting data, it's not up to us in higher ed because of requirements from iPads and, and CES, et cetera. And it always strikes me when, when I look at survey data and even this morning, how we have binaries a lot of the times, male, female. What about those students who don't fall into those categories? And we're constantly othering them. And I get it. Again, it's not a higher red decision. We have certain things. There are certain requirements for how we report data. But also international students. Races for international students, when you look at national data, are reported as an F for foreign. Like ooh, uh, That's once again just othering and um, minimizing, like it's essentially clubbing diverse students into one box, like you're all an F, even though you might be from six different continents or seven continents, including North America. So I think when it comes to those longer term strategies, there's a lot of work to do. And from higher ed, I think we need to be reaching out, whether it's through, through policy briefs or white papers, but informing people at the national level, federal level, that we, we have many more boxes than male and female. And if you club people into these reductive boxes, you are taking away that sense of belonging because you're telling them they don't belong. So. Yeah, such a, a powerful statement as well. And one of the things that we were talking about last night over dinner is that so many of our structures and policies and processes, not in any individual institution, but in higher education more broadly, and you talked about the role that iPads plays and the role some of these things play, they were created at a time, they've not been, they're not accurately representing the current state of, of our world. And uh, these systems were not necessarily designed to support the success of each of our students that we're working with. That's a much longer term, right? That's not a let's fix this week, but that's looking at some of our bigger structures. We think about the notion of decolonizing curricula, for example. When I looked at our own general education process, uh, both at St. Cloud State and now we're starting this at Bowling Green State University, where it was built at a time, uh, and, and so many of our courses are just, um, uh, they just reaffirm binaries and uh, sort of strategies that are that need to be questioned and need to be looked at. So I think that's a great point, looking at some of the foundational structures that might render some other things invisible. Great. We'd love to hear from some other folks too. With the help of our, our student, um, I think brought a really great point that we see pretty commonly across the board with our students. And um, the way it was termed is being a culture of suffering versus a culture of self-care. 
And I know I see it in, in my work with students. I think everybody's kind of shaking their head like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so where does that come from? That's a, it's a tough one. We, we really struggled with it. I actually wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more. I'd be really interested in hearing about how that might play out on a campus or from a student experience. <laughs> We've got five minutes. I mean, I've had students or people like refer to it as like kind of the suffering Olympics, like, you know, how much more work can they put on themselves? How much more pressure can they put on themselves to succeed? Um, you know, and I think ignore the foundational needs that they have. So, you know, I think that's one thing even within orientation that we've tried to talk a lot about is like, what are your base level needs at that point in time? Um, you know, but everybody's like, okay, let's do it. We have to do it now. So, uh, you know, it's, it's the timeliness, you know, I, I, when you talked about what would the first year look like if students really mattered, <laughs> it wouldn't be an expectation that everything happens during orientation week. It wouldn't be an expectation that that is the time where they will learn all the things and comprehend all of the things and absorb all of the things and therefore be successful for the whole year. It is a community wide timeliness thing because then we do run into students that don't remember the resources because their mind was not there. Um, you know, so, so for those examples of, yeah, I failed a test and therefore my life is over. Like I see that with students a lot in our interactions and the idea of, oh, I did horrible. What did you do? I got an A minus. Like, and these are from students that I felt like were very well adjusted student leaders that I worked with all the time. And it's like, what kind of conversation are we having here then in terms of the expectations that the university is putting upon the students? And is the expectation that you must suffer to succeed? And I think in some ways that message is being portrayed because sure, we're a highly selective institution. We choose successful students to attend the university. And I think that there are, at some points, folks within the community that say your academic success is all that matters. And it is important, for sure, but we are missing the element of how do you care for yourself as a student and how do we care for the students as faculty and staff? So, John. I was gonna say the, the other piece of the suffering is how much sleep they don't get, um, which is the common theme in my office of like, I stayed up all night to do this test or I've been up for 36, 36 hours, um, which is why we have couches in our office that are very you, um, heavily used because we use them for napping. So there's like, come in, take a nap, have a seat so that you can actually recharge um, and food. And so part of that suffering Olympus is we, some offices have tried to eliminate some of that or mitigate some of that by providing roadblocks of saying, okay, don't do that, calm down, you'll be all right. Um, but it is a culture of suffering here because our students are either not sleeping, doing way too many academics, or being avoiding of academics by doing way too many student organizations. Um, and so we see the suffering on all levels of that. So, you know, um, there's been conversations already on our campus about this, but the question that you asked is, what do students see in their first, in their classes when they arrive here in their first year that tells them that they matter? Well, many of our students, the vast majority of our students, what they see is a really rigorous five course uh, load, if not more. Um, almost all those courses are going to have hundreds of students in them. And they believe that these are the courses that they must have in order to be successful here. So, you know, it, that's something we've been grappling with, like how do we fix this? How do we make this better? I think we're making some progress, but it's still, you know, the students are driven. I mean, a perfect example is we had a January session and it was designed for one course. And the idea was that it would let them take a lighter load for the rest of the spring semester. But what happened? No, they didn't take a lighter load. They took more because, you know, they just feel like they have to. They're under so much pressure. So the one thing that I want to say is I think a cultural shift that we can make at the level of the faculty is to, to start thinking in terms of what's called student-centered learning and student-centered teaching. 
And I, I'm a psychologist, and in psychology, this has really taken off a bit more, perhaps, than some other disciplines. But it's a complete reworking of the way that faculty think about how their courses are designed. Now, Eddie knows about backward design and all the rest of that, and it's essential to it. But you start with your objectives, but your objectives have to be student-centered to begin with. And everything flows from there. And you can have a very hard course, but if it's student-centered, learning-centered, the students will not be stressed by it. They'll work hard, but they won't be stressed by it. And I think that's really the trick in terms of how our faculty and courses work to make students feel like they belong. Because they can't question that they matter when you teach that way. I appreciate that so much. And I think that, that that shift that you mentioned, I know that we're close to time and I'm sure folks have, uh, but I think that that point is such a critical one too, is that we recognizing the role that faculty play and the influence that they can have, as, as I mentioned, they're gonna be seeing faculty more than probably anybody, just from an, an, a pure number of minutes. Um, than, than many other people on campus. And that notion of centering the student's experience in that, it has nothing to do with rigor, nothing to do with outcomes, nothing to do with um, uh, students' ability to be successful in, in subsequent courses on that same ladder, uh, but really sort of, that's a profound way to show students that they, that they matter. That's so encouraging to hear. Thank you, that's wonderful. Okay, well given um, time, we're at, we're at 11, so we want to honor that. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, if you want to continue the conversation, as I said, fill out that little, little note on, on the table, um, and we'll continue to connect with you. Um, thank you so much. I really wish we had longer to have this conversation. There's so much that, that we can do, um, and, and I really appreciate the, the great comments that were made. Um, one thing that we always talk about is, you know, we do a great job during orientation, students are ready to go, um, but we want to continue that exercise during the school year to where students still feel connected to other people and all of that, and so it's not a, a, a suffrage type of experience for our students. I know oftentimes I hear about them banding together to get through a class or something like that. They almost see it as a badge of honor instead of the enjoyment of learning. Um, and so we want to certainly look at, you know, what if our students mattered? What if our first, student, first year students mattered? And how would we communicate with them? How would we teach them? How would we get them connected? So let's continue the conversation. And thank you so much for spending time with us today.